Afternoon all, I thought I'd go over another classic encounter, this time between Mikhail Botvinnik and Robert James Fisher. So Mikhail Botvinnik, I believe, was world champion at the time in 1962, and this encounter came in the Varna Olympiad final. So uh, the Soviet Union did very well with Mikhail Botvinnik, I, I believe, playing board one for the team, and Fisher was playing board one for the United States. So in this classic encounter, which has been incredibly analysed by many people over the years. Uh, we'll have a look now with the use of uh, Houdini and my own uh, personal take on the game. And of course, with it being extensively analysed, I'm sure variations will mi be missed, but I hope you can get something from this video in any case. So C4 was played by Mikhail, and Fisher reacted with G6, actually. So that's already quite interesting. Not knight f6. Against d4, knight f6 would be more natural. But against c4, without the d-pawn being committed, g6 is also a favourite move of Kasparov. So in their handling against the English opening, they also have a lot in common, Fischer and Kasparov, in their opening repertoires. d4 is now played, and now Fischer places the knight on f6 in front of that f-pawn. It could have been useful if the d-pawn hadn't been committed then maybe potentially e5 would be played bishop g7 and knight g e7. But here we're transposing into the Grunfield variation because now after knight c3, Fischer does not play bishop g7 but instead plays the Grunfield defence. The Grunfield defence was originally thought a bit dodgy by Kasparov but later Kasparov employed the Grunfield with great effect himself. It's in the hypermodern tradition of still trying to encourage white to construct a centre and to try and undermine that centre and attack it later. In particular, usually the d4 square is subject of great attention from the black pieces. So here, Mikhail plays knight f3. OK, Fischer played bishop g7. And now, in true Soviet style, uh, the Russian system was adopted, queen b3. Now, in this system, White is prepared to accept a loss of tempo for the Queen in order to have a more solid centre, potentially. With two pawns sometimes reaching e4 and d4 quite safely supported, it can be quite dominating, the position. Fischer, nevertheless, took on c4, and after Queen takes c4, he castled. Now we have e4, so we have those two centre pawns. So how is Fischer able to undermine them. Often in the Grunfield, c5 is a central strike, but here with the queen sitting on c4, this looks unplayable. c6 looks like a, a favourite for engines to play in this position, and maybe another popular theoretical move. What Fischer adopted to do here was actually to play bishop g4. So, okay, it's putting pressure on that d4 pawn, but now the centre supported with bishop e3. Now we see knight f d7. So with this, there might be the intention of further harassing the white queen on c4. Mikhail Botvinnik plays bishop e2. And now we see knight c6. So it's as if almost, you know, maybe bishop f3 is on the card at some point, and maybe e5 is also tempting at some point. And there's also the option of gaining a tempo on the queen, of course. Here Mikhail played, instead of the routine casting move, played rook d1, further supporting that potentially vulnerable d-pawn. OK, so it's supported now with bishop, rook and queen temporarily. The queen subject to being attacked. And in fact, the queen is attacked in this position. And the queen holds on, actually, to protect the d4 pawn with queen c5. OK, and in this position, Fischer offers a trade of queens. He plays queen d6. OK. Now this is ignored for the moment. Mikhail plays h3. And Fischer obliges with a capture on f3 now, giving up voluntarily. A potentially dangerous uh, light square bishop. But a capture is made by the pawn instead of the bishop here, 
which strengthens e4 a bit. So here we have a seemingly formidable center being supported, not seemingly as vulnerable as many other variations of the Grunfeld defense. Nevertheless, d4 is still subject to great attention here, and Fischer plays rook fd8, bringing another piece to bear on that d4 square. But now d5 is played. And now we see one of the points of taking with the pawn, that knight e5s are not maybe as dangerous for taking on f3 later. And in fact, a knight e5 might be subject to eviction to a later f4 move. So has white succeeded in constructing uh, a dominating center in this position? After knight e5, the move knight b5 is played, challenging Fisher's queen on d6. Does it really want to take on c5 here? If it takes on c5, it looks as though white will have a lot of pressure after bishop takes c5. Attacking two pawns, okay, potentially they can be defended, but it looks like a very pleasant position. And in fact, here, f4 is also looking dangerous, although there might be knight c4. Let's engine evaluate this position. In fact, if Fisher had simply taken the queen here. So queen takes c5 is actually given as one of the better moves. Technically, bishop takes c5. Now instead of meekly defending with rook d7, in fact c6 is given as an interesting move. Inviting positively knight c7. Other moves seem to favour black. So knight c7, and if we go with this, it seems inviting bishop e7, this could lead white into a little bit of trouble. Knight e c4. Bishop takes, knight takes, not to b3, knight takes d6. This is a nice little tricky line the engine has found. And the idea of the bishop takes d6 is to play rook cd8 using that pin on d1. And the fact the king hasn't castled yet. So in this position, after all this, black could have a tiny microscopic advantage in the position. Probably not enough to win. So <laughs> a simple, uh, a very long forcing line there. If after this knight b5, uh, queen takes c5 was played. But no, Fisher in this position plays queen f6. And here, this knight on e5 is chased away, f4, after knight e7. Again, the center looks menacing, but the queen is attacked, surely it goes back. But if it goes back, surely b2 will be lost. If it takes on c7, that will give black too much activity. So actually, is Fisher doing okay here? Has a blunder already occurred with this f4? If we go back for one moment, to this queen f6. It's possible that f4 wasn't the absolute best move in the position. Knight d4 is also considered. But f4 is up there as one of the top candidates. After knight d4, it seems white has a fairly permanent pleasant position, protecting f3 here with that knight. And let's say black tries to undermine with c6, then maybe f4 now has greater impact. Knight e d7, queen a3. And if takes here, e5. Okay. So, So it seems possibly this f4 might be a tiny bit dubious. After knight e d7, not only the queen is attacked, but also b2 is under fire from the battery of queen and bishop here. It's closed off now with e5. And if knight takes c5, then Fish will be losing a piece. Surely after knight takes c5, e takes, he has two pieces and pre. But 
there's a very neat little trick here that Fisher uses to snag a pawn. He plays queen takes f4, a little decoy of the bishop protecting the queen. If now bishop takes, then knight takes c5. And knowing this, Boplik takes that queen anyway and allows knight takes c5. Reasoning perhaps that taking on c7 will give him a small advantage. So we have a very exciting transaction here. So what is going on here? Is this knight vulnerable? Is the center crashing through here? These these two big center pawns are byproducts of playing the Russian system against the Grimfield to get that dangerous center. Is it now dangerously mobile, this pawn center? Rook a c8 prompts d6 to protect the knight. Fisher takes on d6. And OK, it looks like now a real pawn sacrifice for the sake of this really dangerous d pawn. Fisher takes on b2. So he's putting his position under great pressure, potentially. So currently, he is a pawn down, technically. But what to do about this d pawn and these other potentially dangerous threats which could emerge? Like, for example, bishop g4. Although at the moment, bishop g4 might be answerable with f5. Bovenik is in no hurry here. He castles, connecting his rooks. OK. Knight bd7. And now pressure is brought to bear on the c5 knight, rook d5. Also preparing, potentially, to double up rooks. Or maybe to just attack this bishop. If the knight ever moves, b7 will be under fire. OK, b6, strengthening the knight's position. And now we see bishop f3. So there's a lot of pressure for the pawn here. Knight e6, attacking that bishop on f4. And also the knight on c7. So this is a very interesting decision by Fischer because it gives Mikhail Botvinnik the option of sort of fragmenting Mikhail's pawn structure. If we have a look at this position under engine eyes, I wonder if it the engines do do think black is better because black is a pawn up after all. In fact, it, see, it seems knight e6 is one of the strongest moves here to allow this fracturing of pawn structure just to get rid of this knight potentially, or at least threaten to take it. it and with d takes. Although the rook will be putting pressure on d7 and this rook had to move, this knight is supporting this knight. So that move is technically possible and apparently is one of the best moves in the position to play knight e6 here. OK. So knight takes e6, f takes. So there is a target now, that e6 pawn. Rook d3. Now this bishop g4 is no longer answerable with any f5. It really is a target on this diagonal. For the moment though, with Fischer's move, he attacks that rook on d3. Now rook e3, putting pressure on e6. Now instead of passively defending that pawn, which would probably result in disaster in any case, Fischer immediately sacrifices it here to get the d6 pawn. A brilliant tactical stroke is now played here. But what else is there? Fischer plays e5, so he's swapping his weakness to win this. Earlier, it looked as though this might be a dangerous center, which culminated in this d-pawn. But now, with this new transaction, Fischer's going to win that pawn and simply be a more clear-cut pawn up, surely. But what else was there here? A pawn up in this position, he's still going to be a pawn up. But was there any better than e5? Again, engines really like the move e5. Even though it might seem to weaken light squares and invite bishop d5 check, it's still the, the engine preferred move at, at depth 19 in, in any case. So this is what happened. Fischer seems to have nicked pawn and is now swapping that extra pawn for a different extra pawn scenario, a different scenario for the extra pawn. So here, at least Mikhail hasn't got the dangerous bishop pair. It's only a light square bishop. The knight seems strong enough. The rooks seem good enough. 
White's pawns seem quite fragmented, whilst Fisher has two strong pawn islands in comparison. The pawns are connected. So it seems Fisher's doing very well here against Mikhail Botvinnik. Rook e7. But does White have enough peace activity to compensate for being a pawn down? Fisher plays Rook d7. And instead of reinforcing that Rook with Rook e1, in fact, Rook takes d7 is played here. And now this seemingly nasty skewer, Bishop g4, perhaps was the temptation. Rook c7. And now Rook e1, another active Rook coming into the game here. Fisher guards the squares with King f7. Now King g2. So this endgame has been analysed extensively, I believe, by many players over the years. So potentially Fisher's got a two to one pawn majority. Surely you might think he can create a pass pawn. But this bishop is quite dangerous in this situation. It's going to be tricky. So let's see what happened now at move 34. Knight c5. It looks logical enough for the moment. It allows now this next move, rook e7, just to try and trade off rooks. Mikhail's not having any of that. He doesn't want the rooks off for the moment. Plays rook c3 now. And he allows Fisher a seemingly dangerous rook infiltration. So potentially to a4 and put pressure on that a2 pawn. Bishop d1 seems to prevent rook a4. The bishop's covering the main entrance points. Rook d4. Gaining an entrance point potentially of rook d2. But bishop c2 shields that seventh rank a little bit. So if rook d2, it doesn't seem as dangerous. So Fisher now brings up his king. Both kings come into the action now. Now king g5 betrays the idea that maybe you know Fisher is going to put pressure. Also try to put pressure on h3. So although he's been deprived of pressure on a2, he's trying for Mikhail's isolated pawns here. That's fended off, keeping the king in opposition there. Now check though, taking the opportunity to force off the bishop for the knight because of this fork. So we have now a simplified rook and pawn ending. Rook and pawn endings, as I know from recent experience, can be very difficult to win even if you're two pawns up. Now in this position, from an engine point of view, it's only a pawn up and the white rook is active here. and the white king is in opposition at the moment to the black king, fending it off from any weak pawns. But uh, rook a3 is played here. Not the tempting, maybe rook c7, which actually is given as potentially slightly better than rook a3, Mikhail's choice. So with rook a3, what does Fisher do about the a pawn? He plays rook e7. Potentially better was a5. But we're really nitpicking. I think either a5 or rook e7 are among the best moves of the position. It's going to be very, very difficult to win this rook and pawn ending at move 43. In fact, Fish persists though. You know, he's got nothing to lose. He's got the extra pawn. Rook f3 and now rook c7. a4. Maybe trying to potentially bring out you know, to try and exchange off pawns might be useful or just try and keep a grip on the black pawns. The strategy is not yet clear. Rook c5, rook f7. Rook a5. So now Mikhail's taking the decision to give Fisher two connected past pawns for the moment, but gaining a potentially dangerous h pawn mobility. But the g6 pawn stands in the way. So is this even more in favour for black or not. h4 check. Now rook f7 check. The king is being driven away from the g6 pawn. So rook g7 attacking that poor g6 pawn. Rook a1 is played. Now you might wonder in this position, hold on a sec, what about king f6? Was that a useful tempo gain? Let's have a quick look at king f6. If king f6, rook b7. 
Is it really the case that these two pawns cannot make progress here? It does look pretty hard. Let's say check King G4. They are tied down. Can't move the A pawn without losing the B6 pawn with check. So what does black try and do to win this sort of position, this rook and pawn ending? The rook is really tied down to defend A7. It just seems very, very tricky. In this position, it seems white can even afford to play rook c7. Let's see why. If b5, then the rook simply goes back to b7. If a6, then rook b6, and the white king actually might be coming to g5 soon here. And it looks dead equal all of a sudden. So what is happening here? Why not b4 check? King takes g6, and now we've got a dangerous h pawn. And with the rook ideally placed behind this running pawn, this is starting to be, you know, at least equal anyway. So this is a very, very difficult rook and pawn ending for Fisher to win, it seems. He plays actually in this position rook a1. So we now have king f3. Not falling for the trap. Of course, rook takes g6. Rook would be embarrassing in the Olympiad for rook g1 check. So king f3 now threatening the g6 pawn. For real. b5. But again, why isn't the g6 pawn, you might ask, taken here? Well, actually, a very clever alternative is available to white. Instead of winning g6, one of these two dangerous pawns can be eliminated tactically, it seems, with this next move, h5. Because now it seems if g takes, then check, picking up the b5 pawn. Let's have a look. Is this actually one of the strongest moves to play h5 instead of rook takes g6? In this position, in fact, it seems rook takes g6 was, was okay as well. And h5, there's nothing much in it really. Both ideas have merit, either to take, it seems, the pawn immediately. Because if the pawn had been taken immediately, is this pawn really that dangerous? Say king e3, a5, check. It looks more dangerous actually the more you look at it here with these pawns coming down, it looks as though black, from an engine point of view, is gaining power with these two connected pass pawns. So Botvinnik's decision, if we rewind it, this position, seems very clever here to take this opportunity after this b5 move was played by Fischer, leaving it slightly loose for one moment, to tactically play h5 to try and eliminate that pawn via the rook g5 check route. So Fisher here plays rook a3 check, which is engine recommended. And now he does take on h5. What else can he do here? This pawn is potentially really dangerous for h6, h7, if he doesn't do anything. He will just be losing if he tries too hard. b4, h6, and he'll be losing. So he's got to dissolve, allow this these two pawns to go. And now we have a much harder task without the beauty of two connected past pawns. This is a very, very difficult rook and pawn ending to try and win. It's probably a theoretical draw. Check, and the rook goes behind. And the king is, is taking care of one of Fisher's extra pawns. And here, it's very difficult to see how black can make progress. It looks technically a complete draw now. So at move 68, a draw seems to have been agreed between two classic players, Mikhail Botvinnik, the father of the Soviet chess school, one of the fathers, and Robert James Fisher, the American genius. So this is their encounter in the Varna Olympiad 1962. So let's have a look at this game in overview and summary again. So c4, g6, one of Fischer's favourite responses to the English opening, keeping the flexibility of the knight coming to f6. d4, and now we have a transposition into the Grunfeld defence. And in particular, we have the Russian system, which concedes 
uh, some tempo losses potentially on the Queen but white sometimes gets a very strong center with less pressure being able to be placed on it Fisher soon is giving up his light square bishop but it's taken with the pawn instead of the bishop and now we see this knight coming to e5 knowing that f4 might be dangerous for that knight later knight b5 it looks as though there's a lot of pressure on Fisher's position engines light queen takes c5 here very interesting variation but Fisher chose queen f6 now technically it seems knight d4 might be technically superior to f4 but f4 was chosen and in this continuation Fisher nicked a pawn here with a brilliant little mini tactic queen takes f4 so maybe this had Mikhail Botvinnik a little bit worried so he's going uh, temporarily a pawn down soon because to support this knight now it can't go back without losing d5 a center pawn that would be with tempo say knight d5 so he supports it but he's opening up Fisher's bishop on the diagonal and there's a poor b2 pawn as a target here so Fisher a pawn up officially so is it possible though for him to technically consolidate this extra pawn it seems difficult because white has the bishop pair and what happens here is knight e6 Fisher's accepting some structural damage but still he is left with more solid pawns than Mikhail Botvinnik and he gives up that that weakling pawn to win the seemingly previously strong d6 pawn so he solved that problem of the dangerous d d pawn but this end game seems very very tricky to win even though he's a pawn up very very tricky end game to try and force a win the entry points the key entry points were denied this knight e4 simplifying into a purer rook and pawn ending and now we see this a4 move this a4 decision was not to be taken lightly you might think hang on a sec Fisher played rook c5 which seems uh, good because maybe you know rook a5 and that stuff but did he have to leave the seventh frag you might ask or could he have played rook c4 let's just check this other possibility of rook c4 was that any stronger to really question this a4 move we have to give a5 a little positional pawn sack because these two pawns fractured are not as good as connected we know that for many endings that sometimes connected pass pawns they, they have a lot more value so say rook f7 and it looks tricky say a6 there's f4 check say h6 rook takes a7 and we're left with a very difficult scenario a lone pawn versus um, two connected pawns it's not as good so this a4 you know was dangerous so the a5 pawn sack was denied with rook c5 keeping the two pawns for the moment intact Fisher knows the value of the pawns when they're connected is higher instinctively and unfortunately they are broken apart now with a tactic very shortly now this h after b5 trying to make progress this h5 tactic will win the b5 pawn so what else apart from b5 you might ask was there any other way instead of b5 it seems very tricky we had a brief look at king f6 if a5 let's take a5 just rook takes g6 so really the main option you know king f6 you know as, as we saw I believe briefly or maybe we can just revisit this for a moment rook b7 and it really just keeps the pawns in check here it's most likely uh, we'll find that in, in the future with even more powerful computers or table bases that uh, it's a draw in this position it looks fairly drawish there is a saying all rook and pawn endings are drawn and there's some evidence that in most cases that that is true there's a lot of evidence in fact and this is one of those games which 
show how difficult it is you know with a pawn up to try and win it would have been great um blow to the uh the the, the russian uh, school of chess if if mikhail had lost this classic encounter against fisher but uh, no it was a hard fought draw still heavily analyzed for many years after i hope you enjoyed this comments or questions on youtube thanks very much